Hello and welcome to Business Today Television. I'm Siddharth Zarabi and for this very special interview, I'm joined by Mr. Amitabh Kant, one of India's foremost policy makers, a bureaucrat of long innings that he has played and one of the key drivers of the Make in India program. He's currently the G20 Sherpa. And today's interview, Mr. Kant, thank you very much for joining us, is going to focus on Make in India. And I remember when it started off, one of the most visible symbols of Make in India was that mechanical uh, uh, lion. Uh, but we moved a lot from 2014. Uh, for the viewer to s start off our conversation, what have we really achieved from the Make in India initiative? So first, uh, I think, Siddharth, we must understand that uh, Make in India led to a greater ease of doing business in this country. Uh, vast number of rules, regulation procedures were scrapped. 1,500 laws have been scrapped. Uh, second was that the foreign direct investment regime was greatly liberalized. And today, almost 98% of the foreign direct investment comes through the automatic route. You don't need any clearance. And the third was that the patent regime was made faster, quicker, greater number of examiners there and uh, our, the record time in which we give patents is on par with USA and Japan today. So these were the three achievements and uh, fourth in recent times has been uh, the huge focus on production linked incentive scheme and that has started to pay results in some sectors but I think over the next three to four years it will pay dividends and that will give results. But I think the most important thing has been the huge focus of government on infrastructure creation, which will lead to quicker movement of goods, etc. So the government has increased its outlay on expenditure between uh, the last four years. The increase has been almost from 1% of GDP to 4% of GDP. I mean, that's a phenomenal increase of outlays on expenditure. So the quality of your airports, the quality of your roads, the quality of your expressways, all has radically improved. You've seen the trans huge massive improvement in your ports, your expressways. That will pay you dividend in the long run. And that has actually started showing results now. So uh, for instance, the PLI, uh, if you look at it, uh, just, uh, you know, three years back, 81%, 81% of our mobile phones that we use in India were all imported. Today, 81% were the imports. Today, all the mobile phones used in India, 100% of the mobile phones used in India are made in India. Not only that, 25% of the phones made in India are exported today. So we make, uh, in the last four years, we've done about 2 billion 2 billion mobile manufacturing. We do, this year we'll do about 270 million mobile manufacturing. So we become a very, we become the second largest manufacturing nation of mobiles in India today. And that is uh, both Apple and Samsung have made India their major hub for uh, mobile manufacturing. Now you will see the next wave will be for components and components in both mobiles in air conditioners, in uh, uh, automobiles, you'll see this. Once you've got manufacturing, the next phase will be the component manufacturing which will take place. Absolutely, and that's the uh, improvement or uh, graded uh, scale up of PLI 1 to PLI 2. And since you spoke about uh, mobile, telecom alone viewers uh, for the last financial year nearly $11 billion of exports. And that's a very, very significant number. If you were to go back to 2014 or even before, it was uh, hardly $350 million. So it's a huge scale-up. Mm. Uh, Mr. Khan, uh, you know, when this started 10 years back, there were critics because people said, and a lot of well-meaning economists said, that India's story in the last 25, 30 years has been a services-led story. And you cannot replace China. Do you think uh, we are today in a situation where we offer a viable alternative to China as a manufacturing destination. So Siddharth, uh, India cannot grow only on the back of services. That will be a jobless growth. Uh, we must understand that 42% of our population is dependent on agriculture. We need to shift them to better paying jobs in manufacturing. Now manufacturing, urbanization, all have to be key drivers of growth. And we have to enhance productivity in agriculture. That means the total number of wage laborers in agriculture must radically come down. 
Manufacturing has to be the key driver of growth for India's economy. And this can only happen in sunrise areas of growth. So if you look at the PLI, it talks about uh, moving towards electric vehicles. It talks about advanced chemistry cell battery. It talks about renewables, uh, manufacturing, solar plants. Uh, it talks about green hydrogen. It talks about semiconductors. These are the new areas of growth which will give you value in terms of manufacturing. You can't be totally dependent on your traditional sectors of textiles and uh, food processing. Uh, look at what is happening in the automobile sector for instance now. I mean look at Honda, the Elevate model is getting exported back to Japan from India. It's being manufactured in India, getting exported back. The Jimmy of Maruti Suzuki is getting exported back to Japan. So these are all new vehicles where manufacturing is taking place in India but is going to Latin American market, South African market. I mean look at a company like Hyundai. I mean it's exporting uh, almost 40% of its manufacturing to rest of the world from India. India is their manufacturing hub. And now with Toyota is putting up their new plant, uh, uh, Maruti putting up their new plant, uh, Suzuki's uh, new plant is coming up in Gujarat. And you look at this whole movement towards electric vehicles by both uh, Mahindras, which are putting up an EV platform and from 25, they'll roll out five or six new models. But the Big thing is what Tata's have done already in electric vehicles. I mean, Tata's have taken the lead on electric vehicles and therefore they will penetrate the market. Uh, they will take the lead. Everybody is at the same level, but the jump in electric vehicles will be enormous in the coming years. And the challenge for India is that in the next five years, we should make all our two-wheelers, three-wheelers go 100% electric, which has started to happen. And, and, and there are massive uh, ambitions that private yeah. sector companies have. Yeah. Since you mentioned Mahindra and... Purely coincidentally, and viewers, I must tell you this, I chanced upon a tweet uh, from a neighboring country which speaks about the fact that a 60 HP Mahindra tractor sells for $16,700 and a 80 HP one for $26,000 in Nigeria. But that's not the important point. The, this tweet says, 10 years ago when Mahindra set up their tractor assembly plant in Ogun Industrial State near our home in Nigeria, this is an example of how Indian companies are not just making in India, they are making overseas for yeah, overseas. So it's all innovative, it's all cutting edge technology, it's highly price wise competitive. Uh, this is what India has demonstrated to the rest of the world and therefore uh, what you will see in the coming years, both Tata's and Mahindra's becoming the cheapest producer of electric vehicles in the world. And, that would and top class quality. Absolutely and that's what yeah. The, yeah. this example uh, uh, makes sure. Uh, there's a point that we need to discuss in terms of the policy way forward. We've now in the 10th year of Make in India. You've been involved in it from its inception and then others have also come in. What's the future like? What should be done? Uh, because you mentioned this, but we perhaps now need to go to component and subcomponent mm -hmm. level mm -hmm. and get that to happen so that we will move from some percentage of assembly to complete value addition within India. Yeah. So, one is that we must think of size and scale. We must think of many large companies in India. The large companies really create tier 2, tier 3, tier 4 uh, suppliers. Therefore, you then create the backward forward integration for MSMEs. And because we have very large number of MSMEs, it's very important to have large suppliers to size and scale. And it's important that Indian manufacturers must penetrate global markets. Because every time India has grown, it's grown on the back of exports. And therefore, what the two-wheelers are doing, uh, what our vehicles are doing, what now mobile manufacturing is doing is exporting. And therefore, in each one of these sectors, what our pharmaceuticals have delivered, for instance, I mean, each one of our pharma companies have delivered is, they've been the suppliers of medicines and drugs to the world. If they weren't the suppliers, medicines would not have been supplied to Africa and Latin America. Absolutely. And therefore, we've penetrated markets after markets. And that's what in all these new emerging areas of growth. What are the new emerging areas of growth? To my mind, it's going to be electric vehicles. It's going to be advanced chemistry cell battery. We must become the world champion in battery storage, both for mobiles, two-wheelers, three-wheelers, four-wheelers will all run on battery storage. 
uh, electricity will be battery storage and therefore we must now be the next big champion of battery storage and to my mind uh, the world is moving away from fossil fuel to clean energy and clean energy will all be driven by green hydrogen and that is the world will be using renewables India is climatically blessed uh, we can use renewables to crack water produce green hydrogen we should be the cheapest producer of uh, green hydrogen in its liquid form that is ammonia we should be exporting to the rest of the world uh, green hydrogen and ammonia and that is to my mind are the biggest business opportunities which many of our young companies I mean if you look at Green Co, if you look at Acme, if you look at Renew what are they doing? They are moving now from renewables uh, instead of providing just electric green electricity they are providing green molecules they are moving towards value addition they are using uh, renewable energy renewable electricity to produce really clean energy for hard to abate sectors uh, for steel for cement for long distance transport that is where the op big business opportunity leapfrogging quantum jump is required Mr. Kant, it, it is clearly Prime Minister Modi's determination that uh, kick-started it and you started this conversation by giving us um, an insight into uh, the fact that it's not just coming up and setting up a plant you need so much else that needs to be done but one of the issues that comes up especially in these areas that you mentioned including the electric mobility space is the availability of raw materials um, China has done this for years it's grabbed massive market share uh, on a global supply chain we have fixed a lot internally what more needs to be done externally so that we have adequate uh, resources and supplies of raw material to drive this kind of manufacturing in the new era? Yeah. So first of all, uh, let me say that uh, it was uh, Prime Minister's vision when we started Make in India on, to focus on ease of doing business. It was his vision when we started Startup India. There were just about 156 startups. Today we have 110,000 startups, we have about 115 unicorns in India. And uh, the reason why I'm saying this is because if you look at many of our startups, they are working on completely new technology for battery storage. They are working on aluminum air, they are working on sodium. Uh, they Absolutely are cutting edge. Cutting edge uh, technology. So right now, I mean, uh, the lithium batteries require lithium nickel cobalt which is imported but even if you do rest of the value addition in India you will still be doing about close to 80 85 percent of the value addition in India so my view on that is that we need not worry in the global manufacturing some parts will always be imported okay. it's very necessary to understand how if India is to be a part of global value chain some components some inputs will get imported uh, which over a period of time we will start manufacturing here but in the initial period even if you have to import they should all be done at zero level rate of duty we should then manufacture here and re-export and over a period of time four to five years the value addition will keep rising more and more more and more but the important thing is first get the manufacturing here and that is what has started happening in a big way in all these areas. We are getting manufacturing now and in due course we will do more and more, more and more of value addition. How long do you think uh, the exchequer can continue or should continue to support through subsidies uh, these manufacturing initiatives? No, so that, uh, the government, what has it done? Let's try and understand. Government used to support exports earlier, MEIS at the point of export. The government said we will not support at the point of export. We will support at the, we'll support at the point of production mm -hmm. and that is the right strategy. Only if you have large production you will be able to export. You cannot export if you are not able to produce to global size and scale. Mm -hmm. So it shifted that similar outlay mm -hmm. to the point of production mm -hmm. and has supported large scale manufacturing. But what has the government done? The government has said, I'll support you to go r higher and higher and higher and higher for five years. Within five years, you must become global size and scale. We'll not support you beyond that. Secondly, you must meet the production target every year, rising, increasing, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you don't achieve target, you won't get it. Raghuram Rajan has uh, uh, recently uh, written about it and spoken about the fact that he believes India should not seek to replicate China as far as manufacturing is concerned. Is he uh, 
right in his views? Well, I won't agree with him because I really feel that uh, uh, if without a manufacturing uh, nation, India will never become uh, uh, be able to grow at high rates of uh, eight to nine percent per annum. I also feel that you need to take a large number of population away from agriculture into manufacturing. Without that, it will not happen. So. Uh, the, many people feel that the age of manufacturing is over. I do not think so. I really think that the manufacturing will get more digitized, it will get more green, it will get more uh, high tech, but manufacturing will continue in a digitized manner and uh, cutting edge technology in a range of new areas of growth will happen and those, that is where the technological leapfrogging will happen in India. One final uh, point and this is to do with the recent move which caused a little bit of confusion. Uh, there was, of course, a, a sort of rethink on that. This is the so-called ban on laptop imports. A lot of people said, well, there is a plan. The government wants to encourage manufacturing, but wasn't that knee-jerk? Let's leave that incident apart. But do you think tariff and such measures should be used to incentivize manufacturing? <coughs> so, if you look at the world in the past, uh, America, Europe, let's not forget that, uh, even East Asia, they've all been very, very protectionist. Look at the uh, Inflation Reduction Act of USA or the CHIPS Act now. They're highly protectionist. They say we'll support, we'll provide three and a half dollars per kilogram of subsidy for green hydrogen to be produced in the United States of America, not for, ex not for imports, but if you produce only in the United States of America. What are they doing with semiconductor? Are they not supporting their industry? Billions of dollars. <laughs> yeah, billions of dollars. So that's how East Asia did. Each one of these countries did. Uh, so I think it's important for us that in the initial phase, some protectionism is necessary. But if you want to become globally competitive, you need to phase it out over a period of time and become globally competitive. Secondly, I'm a strong believer that imports into goods which are to be manufactured for exports, both components and inputs must come in at zero level rate of duty so that you become an integral part of global value chain. But say that over a period of four to five years, components will get manufactured in India also. And therefore, uh, for making India a very integral part of global value chains, uh, we must uh, ensure make in India is not about protectionism. It's about making India a very integral part of global value chain. And that's how we'll get large companies in, get them to manufacture and within four to five years, get them to do component manufacturing. One quick point. Uh, uh, Foreign Minister uh, Mr. Jayashankar uh, recently said that India is still waiting for a thank you from the global community with regard to inflation that happened in energy and other areas after Ukraine. On that note, uh, do you think uh, the globe also needs to sit up and recognize uh, that in a host of areas, pharmaceuticals, automobiles, many other areas, India is actually providing good quality, finished goods, products at a much more competitive price and therefore India should be recognized for its ability, growing ability in that regard as well, Mr. Khan. Well, if it wasn't for India, the world uh, would have suffered uh, without drugs, supplies, you know, the generic medicine which India supplied at very cheap costs, the world would have hugely suffered, uh, particularly in the global south. Uh, if it wasn't for India's huge capacity to produce vaccines, the world would have suffered during the COVID. Other countries stored vaccines. We did not. We supplied it to the world. Let me also say that if it wasn't for India's great frugal engineering in the automobile sector, uh, we, 49 to 50 percent of our manufacturing is in the automobile sector. If it wasn't cheap manufacturing and very, at very competitive high-tech manufacturing at very competitive rates, if it wasn't for India, the world would not have gone uh, high-tech two-wheelers and three-wheelers from India or even smaller cars from India. So India has really demonstrated its great ability to manufacture, make in India, export to the rest of the world at highly competitive rates and innovative products. In fact, in the fintech banking space as well, but there's uh, so much ground to cover, Mr. Khan. 
Uh, but for now, we'll uh, pause this conversation here uh, because you made the point very clearly that 10 years of Make in India program that Prime Minister Modi uh, pushed and pushed very determinedly and we are now looking at the fruits of that over the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years. And most importantly, when it comes to the youth of India for good quality jobs, that's the way to go. Mr. Khan, thank you very much for your time with us today. With that, it's a wrap on this conversation. If you've been, thank you very much for watching.